All right, hello and welcome everybody. This is the first virtual Heritage Cafe Broadening Horizons and Historic Preservation Lecture for this year. Unfortunately, we cannot do this in person at one of our great local coffee shops, but we are happy to bring this to you virtually and um, glad that we can reach such a wide audience from home. So we have Larry Kreisman, who's going to be talking about the arts and crafts movement in the Pacific Northwest. This series is brought to you by City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office in conjunction with Historic Tacoma and Tacoma Historical Society. I'm Lauren Hukamer. I'm the Assistant Preservation Officer for the city. And I'm gonna pass it on to Kathleen, who is the President of Historic Tacoma, and she will be introducing our speaker. If you have questions, please use the Q and A function, and we will be taking those questions and answering them um, after Larry's presentation. We were also streaming to the Facebook page. So we have Steve and myself monitoring the Facebook page for those questions, and we'll share those with Larry as they come in. Um, you can use the chat function if you have any technical difficulties um, during the presentation. Otherwise, please enjoy. Thanks, Lauren. Hello, and welcome to the Virtual Heritage Cafe. I'm Kathleen Brooker, president of Historic Tacoma. Historic Tacoma promotes, conserves, and enhances Tacoma's historic architectural character. It's really what we do. We welcome you to check out our Facebook page and website at historictacoma.org for updates on local preservation and endangered places. Steve Dunkelberger is joining me from the board this evening. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Lawrence Kreisman. I've had the pleasure of knowing Larry as a colleague and friend for many years. Larry was program director of Historic Seattle before and after I was there as the executive director. While at Historic Seattle, he developed a devoted following around his own passionate interests in art and architectural history. Many of you may have attended Larry's signature event, the Bungalow Fair in Seattle, but he's equally known for developing wonderful tours of historic places across the region and beyond. Now retired, Larry continues to speak and lecture and is the author of numerous books on regional architecture and preservation. This evening's program is based on his beautiful publication, The Arts and Crafts Movement, in the Pacific Northwest, co-authored with Glenn Mason. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Larry. Thank you, Kathleen. It's, it's really a pleasure to talk about this again. It's, um, it's been a love's labor and I remember Glenn and I struggled for over three years to produce this body of work, partly because we felt that nobody was paying attention to the Northwest and its wonderful resources. Um, so, um, and um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it was a touring exhibit um, organized by the Museum of History and Industry in 2009, which did end up being in Tacoma for a number of months. And I hope that some of you who are watching, listening tonight will be remembering some of those things. And I'll remind you at the end as well. So with that, I'm going to start our lecture and uh, we will move along. Just gonna take me away for a second so that you don't get distracted. Um, <clears throat> During his January 1909 lecture tour of the West Coast, the renowned British designer C.R. Ashby presented three lectures on the arts and crafts in Seattle and one in Portland, Oregon. And on the right end of the screen, you'll see uh, Ashby and his wife being toured around Seattle on a clear January day probably through Interlake and Park. Um, Ashby's letters when he was touring the United States are most revealing. He was quite blunt in his opinions about what he saw on his trip. He despised the work of the Gorham Silver Factory. He called Rookwood pottery rubbish. Uh, unimpressed by what he referred to as the crowding, the pollution and degradation he'd seen in New York, Pittsburgh and Chicago, he was fascinated and delighted with the West. Ashby wrote in his journals that Seattle was, quote, the only American city I have so far seen in which I would care to live. 
all the gold of Ophir would not tempt me to live in one of those smug eastern cities. Here is a city with a new light in her eyes. His wife, Janet, remarked on the city's cosmopolitanism, its well-appointed restaurants decorated with the latest arts and crafts distinction of line and coloring. Here's a lovely view of the old Frederick and Nelson store, the writing room there, all done in arts and crafts furnishings, but reminding us of the Glasgow style as well. Of course, most of the things that Mrs. Ashby saw when she visited are no longer around, but her, her uh, descriptions really evoke the ambience. Her comments reveal that Pacific Northwest was participating actively in the important design and reform movement that had roots in 19th century Britain, but soon was taken to heart by America. The ideals of the arts and crafts movement, a celebration of craftsmanship and creative process, an appreciation of sound construction, pleasing proportion, grace and simplicity, and a comfortable rusticity that sees beauty in nature and honors indigenous materials, found fertile ground in Washington and Oregon. The effect was seen in a remarkable variety of public and private architecture, including progressive commissioned residences, rustic lodges, and bungalows for everyone. Architects and designers striving to create environments of domestic comfort found what they wanted in the stock of locally available logs and cedar shingles river rock and stone. Regional distributors assured that furniture, metalwork, and tile of the most significant American companies were shown and promoted in the Northwest. Department stores had specific displays of stickly and limber furniture. Public and private buildings included Tiffany glass, Rookwood and groovy tile fireplaces, lighting fixtures from Gustav Stickley's Craftsman Workshop. Regional distributors, <coughs> excuse me, regional architecture clubs organized exhibitions that showcased the works of nationally and locally known architects and interior designers. Arts and crafts societies trained art workers and hobbyists alike. Handcraft and fine art exhibitions were regularly held in Seattle, Portland, Eugene, and other cities. These exhibitions often preceded and encouraged the establishment of regional museums. And there were also modest sales rooms organized by art groups in Portland, Spokane, Bend, and elsewhere. Painting and printmaking, photography, graphic arts, book design, illustration were also pivotal to the national movement and were showcased by local artists and designers. School children were brought up with a respect for handwork and with skills that would serve them well in building homes, making furniture, and shaping metalwork were doing embroidery, china painting, jewelry, basketry, and book arts. The exploration of arts and crafts ideas was inspired by designers in a number of countries whose theories and the products spread quickly in America and even as far west as Washington and Oregon through design journals and newspapers, visits by some of the leaders of these movements and their own travels in the east and midwest and abroad. For example, Seattle architect Charles Bebb, whose work in the office of Lewis Sullivan in Chicago is evident from the magnificent ballroom he designed for the Frederick Stimson family home in Seattle in 1904, may also have become familiar with <coughs> Morris, William Morris, the great British designer, his work uh, from his Chicago years. And when St. Paul decorator William French came out to decorate the Bebb designed house, which included Morris papered bedrooms, as you can see, he gave Bebb the present of a bound copy of William Morris and his art. <clears throat> the work of British architects C.F.A. Voisey and M.H. Bailey Scott influenced Canadian and American architects to look away from high style historic eclecticism and seek out an appropriate domestic style. An excellent example of this is the British Columbia architect Samuel McClure's design for a bungalow for Scotsman David Ramsey in the central Washington farming community of Ellensburg. Alfred Bodley, who may have worked for McClure, partnered with Seattle architect John Graham Sr. in a Seattle residence for the Ferry and the Leary families. For the Learys, Donegal woven carpet attributed to Voise share rooms with specially commissioned Rookwood tiles. 
A Tiffany peacock in garden window was the centerpiece of the great hall with a smaller Puget Sound window in a bay. Gustav Stickley's Craftsman took note of the commission in its October 1908 issue, although Stickley assumed wrongly that the window was to, to embellish a stairwell. He said, an excellent example of American stained glass is now on exhibit at Tiffany Studios on Madison Avenue. It is a large staircase window executed in febrile glass under the personal direction of Mr. Lewis C. Company, Tiffany, <clears throat> and is intended for the home of Mrs. E.F. Leary in Seattle, Washington. The design shows an Italian landscape, a glimpse of a garden with a vine covered pergola with a lake just beyond and a low range of hills in the background. The foreground is a mass of gorgeous color as it is filled with luxuriant foliage and masses of hollyhocks and azaleas in full bloom. The most notable figure in the composition is the peacock in the foreground, which has been treated with admirable decorative effect. Owing to the difficulties presented by the design, the most careful use of materials was required for the execution of this work. The glass was made especially for this window and no surface paints or pigments have been used all the gradation of color and all the effects of light and shade are obtained wholly in the glass itself, with the result that the full qualities of depth and brilliancy have been preserved. And when the Burke Museum in Seattle is reopened, um, you are welcome to go there and see this wonderfully restored and reinstalled window and its mate. The more modest English vernacular home of the Ferry family featured Gruby tile, and glass mosaic by one of Frank Lloyd Wright's favorite Chicago firms, Giannini and Hilgart. <clears throat> in Portland, leading designers were also inspired by English prototypes. Wade Hampton Pipes actually studied in London's Central School of Arts and Crafts during its golden age as a teaching facility for art workers before opening his Portland practice in 1911. He built a reputation on his English arts and crafts residences doing them into the 1950s, despite everybody's move to mid-century modern. Albert Hubbard's Roycroft community in East Aurora, New York had begun in 1897, but Hubbard traveled throughout America, including Spokane, Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, Salem, and Eugene on lecture circuits. <coughs> and his experiences in cities far and wide were published in The Frog. The founders of Seattle's Beaux Arts Society and Workshop in 1908, Frank Calvert and Alfred Renfro, planned their 50 acre community where art workers could live together, work together, and play together on the shores of Lake Washington, inspired by C.R. Ashby's Guild of Handicraft and Hubbard's efforts in East Aurora. Ideas emerging in other countries were welcomed in the Pacific Northwest. The unified interiors of Charles Rennie Mackintosh were popularized in the press and account for Spokane architect Kirkland Cutter's Glasgow interiors for the ladies' reception room at his at Lewis Davenport Spokane Hotel. And the work of the Darmstadt Art Colony and the Wiener Rückstadt, modeled after Ashby's Guild, were also well known by a periodicals and likely influenced the design of the Orange Blossom Bar in Davenport's restaurant, the upper right as well as Davenport's personal dining room on the uh, lower left. The German and Austro-Hungarian exhibits at the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exhibition in St. Louis offered Americans some of their first glimpses of secession design in America. Davenport accompanied Kirkland Cutter to the St. Louis Fair and was smitten by the designs of the Germans. He purchased an important clock designed by Alban Mueller of the Darmstadt Art Colony, and it was the focal point above the fireplace in his wood paneled living room suite, which was furnished with lighting fixtures from Stickley's Craftsman Workshop, a Lewis Comfort and Tiffany lamp, and furniture by Stickley and Limbert, probably the most important arts and crafts interior in the Northwest, no longer there. <clears throat> I'll blame the smoky air on my cough. <clears throat> World's Fairs in Chicago, oh, uh, in Portland, architect William Knighton was inspired by these German and Austrian designs in the terracotta detailing of the Hotel Steward, 
Seward and its mosaics and stained glass, probably by Portland glass artist Edward Bruns. In his writing, Knighton acknowledged the groundbreaking work of the Vienna Secession and their efforts to develop a new non-historicist approach to design. World's Fairs in Chicago in 1893, St. Louis in 1904, gave Oregon and Washington the means to promote themselves in the world. It also brought attention to the consideration of building with native materials and finding a vernacular that fit the region that would be explored again at the Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland in 1905 and the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in Seattle in 1909. And while the buildings of these fairs were modeled after the classicism of the Chicago Fair, several signature pavilions, the forestry buildings, were dramatic log buildings that spoke of the power of native Northwest timber <coughs> and honest construction techniques. The Seattle Fair celebrated Washington's distinct advantage of access to the Far East and Alaska, embracing the cultural and design heritage of both areas in its Tory entrance gates. And you can see the drawing for that on the upper left. Japanese pavilions and tea houses were particular hits that inspired appreciation of Far Eastern design. Their simplicity, the outdoor and indoor connections, and the romantic landscape caught the eye of many who saw their application to oriental bungalows with upturned gable ends and wisteria-covered porches. Public buildings such as this YWCA on Puget Sound and the transit station house at Point Defiance Park in Tacoma popularized it. But it was the log structures on the grounds that reminded visitors of the remarkable resources of the West while encouraging appreciation of the rustic style. While the forestry building attracted the most attention, <clears throat> there were others that in the long run probably had a greater impact on attendees as they searched for appropriate residential ideas. One was the Arctic Brotherhood, a fraternal and benevolent organization. The building contained about 100 pieces of furniture made from Alaska spruce and red and yellow cedar. An arts and crafts clubhouse designed by local architect Ellsworth Story was built for the Hoo Hoo, a national lumberman's fraternity. Passing through its half timbered and stucco facade, visitors found cozy, comfortable and honest spaces. In his design of the building furniture and many of its appointments, Story may have been inspired by exposure to ideas from the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society during his education and early work experience there in 1901 and 1902. And you'll notice that these rocking chairs were probably comfortable for a short while, but not meant to keep people in, in their comfort level too long before they go, went out to go see what the other fair activity was. There was also the American Women's League, which was founded by Edward Lewis with the intent of creating community meeting houses nationally. It gave visitors a glimpse of how furniture, textiles, lighting, and stencil wall treatments could turn a bungalow into a home. Um, the State Federation of Women's Clubs was also filled with mission furniture, credited for permanency and durability, and this picture of the second floor shows an exhibit of over a thousand objects of women's work and handicraft collected throughout the state. And while the Federation accepted everything sent to them, there's another exhibit, the sixth annual exhibit of the Washington State Arts and Crafts Society, which was under the direction of the Women's Century Club, and that was much more selective, although we've never been able to come across any pictures of it. Another important aspect of the fair was the education building where the work of progressive manual arts programs in the state's public schools were showcased. Booths were filled with mission chairs and settles, reading tables and writing desks, lamps and, and metalwork made by the boys, and the walls displayed paintings, drawings, and all manner of handwork. The Olympia School District provided daily demonstrations. And of course, learning furniture and handicraft skills was encouraged along lines which were clearly drawn, generally the boys who made the furniture and the metalwork and the girls learned needlework, embroidery, china painting and leatherwork. So as a teaching tool, the fairs exposed the public to a broader range of design efforts than most had ever seen, bringing together the wealth of Asia, Europe and Alaska and America. 
While only a small number of these products could be considered part of the growing arts and crafts movement, nonetheless, they were there to see. Tiffany glass, Rookwood pottery, metalwork furniture, lighting, ceramics by professionals, by amateurs, by students. Visitors to the fair dined at mission tables, sat on mission settles and rockers, wrote their postcards at arts and crafts desks, lit by slag glass lights. Undoubtedly, they went home at night dreaming of how to incorporate these new and enticing objects into their current homes, and perhaps consider investing in a new bungalow in Westover Park, Laurelhurst or East Moreland in Portland, Ravenna Park, Wallingford or Mount Baker in Seattle, Proctor, Hilltop, Lincoln Stadium, North Slope in Tacoma, or Rockwood and Corbin Park in Spokane, and any number of new and expanding neighborhoods in Oregon and Washington cities and towns. <clears throat> While fairs were temporary, their physical beauty also encouraged city beautiful planning. Seattle's Virgil Vogue Plan of 1911 and Portland's E.H. Bennett Plan of 1912 the architectural community responded with permanent buildings in the central business district that reflected current thinking about the role of scale, proportion, harmony, and integrity of structure and materials. Ideas that were very similar to arts and crafts beliefs. <clears throat> Despite the assertive classicism with which they greeted the public, the interiors of many of these buildings, particularly the clubs, hotels, and libraries, were designed and outfitted in the arts and crafts style. The style extended to train depots, such as the waiting room at King Street Station, to churches and commercial buildings as well. And, and we can speculate that seeing what might be considered an incongruous melding of Mission Oak furniture outside the temple-like spaces of the Washington State Building in the AYP on your right, um, in some ways legitimized its use in everyday world downtown in a similar fashion. And we can also speculate that the cost was always a factor in interior decoration and furnishings, regardless of the wealth <coughs> of the club's members. Mission Oak furniture would have been significantly less expensive than mahogany and carved pieces. The latter were used for the high-end dining and reception rooms. But the lounges, libraries, billiard and card rooms, which generally required numerous pieces of furniture, might best be furnished with affordable pieces that could handle heavy use and even abuse with hardly a nick or stretch. The mahogany paneled main lounge of the Sorrento Hotel, the focal point of which was a specially commissioned Rookwood fireplace, had mission rockers. It was out of the central district that the harmony of exterior and interior succeeded. Arts and crafts design ideas found their niches in country clubs for the well-to-do, such as Kirkland Cutter's Swish Chalet in the Highlands, for the Seattle Golf and Country Club. And you'll notice that the, the chandeliers are comprised of golf clubs. Um, and then smaller, more modest planned neighborhood clubs, such as this one in Mount Baker neighborhood in Seattle. The style was perfect fit for the Pilot Boot Inn in Bend, Oregon on the upper left, or Bay Area architect Bernard Maybeck's hotel one of only a few surviving buildings that were part of a master plan community in Brookings, Oregon, on the right. And it was used for bungalow offices for lumber companies in Southwest Washington on the lower left. And the Swiss chalet style, often associated with arts and crafts, inspired the design of an enormous saltwater swimming pool in Tacoma's Point Defiance Park. <coughs> and I have a little water here. Interest in vernacular regionalism grew and the idea of rustic simplicity, native materials, and hand-built character as expressed in exhibition buildings were realized in informal summer cottages and more substantial townhomes. The collecting of Native American culture became popular as well. Frederick Stimson displayed baskets in the billiard room of his Queen Anne Hill home, and you might notice that the lighting fixtures are arrows. Judge Burke and his wife indulged their collecting interests both at their lakeside retreat, Illahi, which is this quite hodgepodge collection on the upper right, and at their more sophisticated First Hill home where Kirkland Cutter was commissioned to design an arts and crafts gallery edition 
with a teepee inspired copper fireplace hood. Fresh back from a trip to Switzerland, Midwest born Ellsworth's story took some form ideas from the vernacular chalet to design two connected houses for his family and for his parents. Local river rock and shingle, wide overhangs, and ribbons of windows with his signature mullion arrangements made for a unique vocabulary that he also used in other commissions. There he is working, building his own house. And in Portland, well-to-do residential districts filled with substantial, sophisticated interpretations of British and American arts and crafts by Wade Hampton Pipes, Emil Schacht, Ellis Lawrence, and William Knighton. John Bennis <clears throat> took an interest in the Prairie St School and practically at the same time as the Seattle firm of Willitson and Byrne were doing their signature Prairie works in Seattle. There's an example on Queen Anne on the left, lower left and in the Highlands. Bennis was doing similar though more classically derived commissions as you can see on the lower right. Portland's most elaborate response to the California bungalow was Los Angeles architect Francis Brown's design of an expansive house and outbuildings for Wilbur Reed in 1914. <clears throat> for rich and poor alike, a new American vernacular vocabulary arose to answer the question, what does home mean? With streetcar lines making it possible for people to move further away from the industrial and commercial areas, fortunes were made in single family real estate development. Evocative promotional brochures were persuasive and in this niche, the bungalow found a perfect fit. The local libraries subscribed to House Beautiful, House and Garden, Ladies Home Journal and Gustav Stickley's The Craftsman. The ease with which Stickley made plans available to people anywhere in the country is evidenced in a home built on a ridge above Frink Park in Seattle's Leshy neighborhood. The plans for the house, number 78, were published in The Craftsman, November 1909, and they were ordered by Mrs. Henry Holmes and shipped to her from New York on August 28, 1910, as a wedding gift for her daughter, Ruth. And as you can see, the Holmeses had a Victorian turreted house on the ridge, and they made space on their property for this Craftsman home from the Stickley Company. On the lower part of the screen, you see the Gillilands who also uh, did the same thing. They were in Portland. They opted for a stickly plan for their home, but they decided to uh, tweak it a bit. So they asked the architect Ellis Lawrence to do that for them. But local residents didn't need to go to Stickley when they had Judd Yoho in their midst. Bungalow Magazine was published by Seattle's self-proclaimed bungalow craftsman from 1912 to 1918. The magazine offered a bungalow a month with complete working drawings. To no one's surprise, these promoted Yoho's construction company, Craftsman Bungalow Company. That name prompted a lawsuit brought by Gustav Stickley in 1913. Despite Yoho's agreement to refrain from using the word, he continued to promote Craftsman Bungalows, perhaps realizing that as Stickley moved toward bankruptcy, it was safe to do so. During its lengthy run, Bungalow Magazine provided readers with information on a whole range of topics in bungalow culture, from the actual construction of homes to the tiniest details of its interior finishes, furniture, accessories. It carried regular features on gardening and a how-to for amateur woodworkers wishing to build their own furniture. And it featured buildings in nearly every corner of the country. Yoho had plenty of competition in the building industry from architects and plan book publishers in, in Seattle, Portland, Spokane, Tacoma, small cities in the region. And because the impact was a wonderful wide range of bungalows and craftsman homes that arose in city, suburb, and in rural countryside, many complete with up-to-date built-ins, mission furniture, hammered lighting, stenciled walls, embroidered table runners. The American dream was repeated in every community as family after family moved their goods into arts and crafts homes of their own. The geographic diversity of Oregon and Washington also lent itself to a variety of outdoor recreational and leisure time activities. It provided a healthy environment away from the polluted city air, <clears throat> not quite as bad as today in Seattle. 
um, for recovery from tuberculosis and other diseases. Inspired by Old Faithful Lodge at Yellowstone Park, mountain and lakeside lodges were built, such as Paradise Inn and the Crater Lake Lodge, and in the 1920s, Lake Quinault and Mount Baker Lodges. Many of these properties were outfitted with appropriate mission or rustic furniture. Sanatoriums and health resorts were established, and small bungalows and cottages were built in forests and along the coastline. They were heavily promoted as an ideal solution for people willing to, to escape the urban pressures of life. Zoe Kincaid of the Seattle Mail and Herald poetically captured the value of this lifestyle. She said, people of modest means build bungalows half hidden by the firs and but a short distance from the salt water. Some of these homes are of logs and built upon mountain slopes that command a sweeping view of the water. Others are nestled among the shrubbery close down to the tide. To own five acres of woodland and a bungalow is to live a luxurious and independent life. Year after year, the owners of the bungalows return to their homes in the woods. Their children grow straight as pines, learned in watercraft and wood lore. Brought up in the shadow of the mountains, they are taught to be true Westerners, men and women of right living and thinking. These retreats ran the gamut from rustic to sophisticated. Mr. Bernard's Fur Lodge, a log cabin estate at Alki Point, which some of you may have heard of because it was the Alki homestead for many years, and its carriage house is where the Southwest Seattle Historical Museum is. Um, it was purposely rustic. Frederick Stimson's Hollywood Farm on the upper right was an expansive bungalow built to accommodate a constant flow of visitors and family members. The half-timbered Kleiss estate, Willowmore, had both formal and informal spaces. I showed you the billiard room in a very early slide, and here's the living room, um, furnished with Gustav Stickley Craftsman Workshop fixtures, hammered copper hearth, woodland frieze, and then on the lower right, in the exclusive Highlands, Andrew Willison designed an exquisite prairie school home for the Carey family, which was only partially completed. Then to top it all off, in an unlikely rural area of central Washington, Duluth, Minnesota attorney Chester Congdon irrigated a large section of North Yakima for his apple orchards and had architects Kenyon and Maine of Minneapolis design West Home, a stone castle with interiors and furnishing designed or selected by William French Company in St. Paul. All the wood and iron fittings and fixtures, all the glass and tile, nearly everything but the concrete and the stone was shipped out by rail car from the East and the Midwest for assembly on the site over a two year period beginning in 1914. <clears throat> this period of house building and furnishing offered new opportunities for interior decorators with a background in design art or architecture who began to promote their talents in Northwest newspapers and publications. For example, in Spokane, architect C. Ferris White owned the studio of decorative art and advertised on the back of a 1909 postcard that they had in stock, quote, high grade wallpapers and interior decorations, end quote. You can see pictures of this, of the many things that he carried in his studio showroom. And architect Kirkland Cutter, not to be outdone, was involved in an interior design firm with uh, Mr. Plummer for some time. And uh, you can see that in his 1909 ad. And then Frederick and Nelson and John W. Graham Company advertised their own line of interior furnishings. <coughs> Several regional architects found additional avenues for their aesthetic sensibilities by designing furniture and lighting fixtures as part of a whole, such as the furniture designed by Ellsworth Story for the Hoover House. Wade Pipes, the Portland architect, designed a, a dining room set made of myrtle wood for San Francisco's Panama Pacific International Exhibition in 1915. And in Seattle, Langdon Henry commissioned Andrew Willison, who had worked for Frank Lloyd Wright's Oak Park Studio, to design prairie style furniture and lamps for his home. Furnishing public and private spaces was easy. 
One of Seattle's leading department stores, Frederick and Nelson, advertised a bungalow line of furniture. However, there were a number of local companies, including uh, Empire in Seattle, Tacoma Chair, F.S. Harmon and Carmen in Tacoma, Peters Manufacturing, an Oregon furniture company in Portland that could have accommodated orders if purchasers were not buying Stickley, Limbert, or Roycroft through the local outlets that handled these companies. Tubbs and Gibbs in Spokane, Great Grote Rankin in Seattle, Portland, and Spokane, and many other retailers advertised national goods that found their way to every corner of both states. Many regional furniture making companies produced look-alike furniture designed to compete against the big name brands. And some were cheaply made and not always aesthetically pleasing in design or proportion. An exception was the Oregon Share Company of Portland and their marketing campaign claimed that even though their competitors furniture was cheaper, when compared side by side, quality would win out over a matter of a few dollars. By 1914, the company was producing a line of high quality mission furniture that was either labeled or branded Kingcraft. In 1913, Seattle Standard Furniture Company celebrated its anniversary with a home show and erected a model bungalow complete with river rock to showcase its mission and wicker lines. Local businesses dealing with every aspect of interior furnishing profited from the domestic reforms stimulated by the arts and crafts. Typical of these were a number of companies that specialized in stained and leaded glass. The Povey brothers, best known for their medieval or classical style church and fraternal installations throughout Oregon and Washington, found a supportive client base <coughs> for its residential windows, such as this example in a Portland home. Edward Bruns, who I showed you his work on the Seward Hotel, perhaps best represented the arts and crafts style of work. He's first mentioned in a 1908 Portland Architectural Club exhibit where he showed 21 sketches, drawings, and designs, including lead glass designs for the Glenwood Inn in Riverside, California, and drawing for leaded glass, glass landscape titled Pasadena. Bruns had worked in Los Angeles before coming up to the Northwest. He did major commercial work, such as the Seward Hotel, and in 1915, he exhibited nine leaded glass designs in the art room of the Oregon building. The firm also produced lighting fixtures, such as this one in the Prairie School style. Here's a photo of the Portland workroom showing similar shades in the process of being manufactured. In Seattle, the C.C. Belknap and, and Raymond Nyson firms also provided glass for homes, churches, and commercial buildings. Presentation drawings are, of these are two of the many designs executed by Raymond Nyson, uh, who worked for Belknap and later established his own company. And I will give a plug to a lecture I'm doing later in the fall for Historic Seattle on Seattle's stained glass legacy, which goes into some depth on a lot of the work that was done here. Architectural clubs in Portland and Seattle provided the opportunity for building trade companies and artisans to join architects and draftspeople in showing off their skills and wares in annual exhibitions. And artists and craftspeople were also well served by the growth of arts and crafts societies and workshops. <coughs> From the founding of the Boston Society of Arts and Crafts in 1897, hundreds of societies had formed throughout America to explore arts and crafts ideals and products through exhibitions, sales rooms, periodicals, and classes. In the Pacific Northwest, the Arts and Crafts Society in Portland took center stage. It was founded by Julia Hoffman in 1907 with 85 members. Her family and professional connections in Boston led to a series of exhibitions that featured important American designers from the East and the Midwest, along with a fledgling group of local men and women working in metal, textiles, ceramics, and leather. The first of these exhibits in 1907 featured the work of many members of the Boston Society, and it received excellent local press. The green ruby pot that belonged to Julia may have come from that exhibition. She was an accomplished craft worker in metals and weavings, and some of her silver work is in the collection of Oregon College of Art and Craft, the institution which is a direct link to the original Arts and Crafts Society in Portland. <clears throat> Hoffman also left another legacy, 
Her daughter, Margaret Marjorie Hoffman Smith, became the chief designer in charge of the interior and furnishing of Mount Hood's Timberline Lodge. Even though it was built in 1936-37, Timberline epitomized arts and crafts ideals through the employment of local artisans to carve wood, forge metal, weave tapestries to embellish the interior spaces in the lodge. And as the Tacoma Art Museum is now reopened, you might want to spend time at the WPA Artists Exhibit, which has a large section in the catalog uh, focused on her work at Timberline. This period was also a key starting point in Seattle for artist collectives that included Mrs. Bush's art studio and nearby the home of the Beaux-Arts Institute, the teaching arm of the Beaux-Arts Workshop that commercial artists Frank Calvert and Alfred Renfro established as part of their village community concept on Lake Washington. But it was the Women's Century Club that beginning in 1904 under the umbrella of the Washington State Arts and Crafts Society presented the work of local artists and craftspeople at annual arts and crafts exhibitions in its clubhouse that culminated in 1909 in the manufacturer's rotunda at the AYPE. And Glenn and I regret that we never were able, as much as we tried, to find any minutes or descriptions or photographs from that period. So keep looking. One of the leading figures in the Seattle craft scene was metalsmith Albert Berry. Born in England, Berry moved with his family to America in 1888. He studied at the Rhode Island School of Design and worked as a designer of gold and platinum jewelry and silverware at the Gorham Company and later Tiffany's. He moved to Alaska in 1905, where he met and married his wife, Erwina, herself an artist. The Berries opened a retail shop in Juneau featuring hand hammered copper that also, also included Indian and Alaskan motifs and incorporated the use of fossil ivory. <coughs> They moved to Seattle in 1918 and established a similar retail shop and studio. It quickly became a stopping point for tourists and residents interested in handwork and Indian imagery. An article in a 1921 issue of Seattle's Town Crier reported, quote, there is at the Berry Handcraft Shop a pervading atmosphere of artistry and goodwill, making one feel the truth of the old saying that art is the expression of a man's joy in his work. Although more commonly known for their silver jewelry and souvenir spoons, the Seattle firm of Joseph Mayer did some fine silver work that compared favorably with any of their national competitors. This is a sterling silver coffee service with hammered strap pattern made by for a member of the Mayer family. Florence Knowlton may have arrived in Portland around 1907 because she exhibited a silver bowl and a copper frame that year at the Arts and Crafts exhibition. She opened a handcraft sales shop in 1912. When people saw her work and explained, I would love to do that, she was quoted as saying, surely nine out of 10 of these enthusiasts would change their minds if they followed any good piece of handiwork from start to finish. Manual and applied art programs in schools in Washington and Oregon regularly gave instruction in jewelry making and metal. Ranging from a simple copper lirler opener to a sterling silver brooch, most of the unsigned metalwork found in the region today is probably from such classes. Regional distributors of tile assured that the work <clears throat> of the most significant American companies was shown and promoted in Washington and Oregon. The Kellogg showroom in Seattle with branch showrooms in Tacoma, Portland, and Spokane, was a major supplier of Brookwood, Ruby, Bachelter, and Mercer tile. Kellogg's ad in 1909 featured an original medieval Rookwood design for the Charles Black House in Seattle. And he designed a Mount Hood scene for the Hotel Oregon in Portland and the Rookwood fireplace for the Sorrento Hotel in Seattle. The 1908 Rookwood installation for the Tacoma for the Totem Lounge of the New Washington Hotel in Seattle, emphasized the mountain scenery, the flora and fauna, and native Indian motifs of the Pacific Northwest. The surround of Mount Rainier was framed by ceramic totem poles, and the mantle supported with Haida Indian corbels. And then the John Leary residence in Seattle featured several Rookwood installations, including a design for the library fireplace depicting the Columbia River. 
California companies, including Bot Shelter, made their way into the Northwest market. Here are Moresque tiles of Oakland, which produce decorative tiles of Oregon scenes, including Crater Lake and Multnomah Falls. While Kellogg of Seattle and Fred Wagner of Portland designed client-specific installations, so did local architects. Around 1910, Kirkland Cutter prepared this watercolor display board showing his plan to combine a stylized Northwest Evergreen tree freeze with their proposed fireplace tile installation, but we don't know if it was ever done. <clears throat> One of the few Northwest businesses that actually produced art tile as part of their commercial venture was the Washington Brick, Lime, and Sewer Pipe Company, located in Clayton, Washington, but headquartered in Spokane. The company became known uh, for its ornamental terracotta work, and in the 20s, aggressively marketed their Waco line of art tile inserts and pavers. Easily mistaken for bot shelter, many tiles in the Northwest home may well be Waco. There was no shame in reproducing almost word for word Bachelter's work. Pottery from national companies such as Tico and Rookwood were advertised locally. Exhibitions featuring Newcomb, Weller, Van Briegel, Marblehead, and Dedham um, were shown here. And utilitarian, utilitarian earthware made from local clay deposits which had been produced in Oregon and Washington since the 1860s, did not really result in too many regional pottery companies establishing themselves in either state. But the absence of art pottery was more than compensated by the abundance of hand-painted china. Instruction in china painting was a popular occupation for women trained in art and design, and ceramic clubs and studios arose in many Oregon and Washington communities. The June 1910 issue of Ceramic Studio featured designs submitted by members of the Portland Ceramic Society. By the first part of the 20th century, manual, domestic, and applied arts training were part of most grade and high school curriculums throughout Oregon. Pacific Northwest colleges, in an effort to attract young women students, began to offer classes in the domestic and applied arts too. Manual arts classes already were part of a college training program available to male students. These vintage photographs in the archives of Oregon State University in Corvallis give us a snapshot of the variety and quality of manual and applied arts produced between 1915 and 1925. And while it wasn't the center for hand press publishing, much of the printed ephemera of the period seemed to show the influence of Arthur Wesley Dow and his colleagues on the East Coast. Book designer Will Ransom brought the spirit of Roycroft's uh, bookbinding to his short-lived Snohomish venture, The Handcraft Press, in 1901 with his printing of Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott. In the front of the book, Ransom explains his venture, <coughs> quote, a love for beautiful books and a slight knowledge of the technical processes of their making have created in me <clears throat> a desire to build some volumes by the labor of mine own hands. The creative instinct has ever been strong within me, and while the possession of that instinct does not always imply the creative ability, it urges me to the effect and the effort without thought for the result. Therefore have I established in Snohomish, Washington, what it has pleased me to term the handcraft shop, wherein from time to time, I shall print by hand a few books, each one as beautifully as may lie in my power. Of course, he only printed two books and he was off to Chicago to a brilliant career. <clears throat> there were also talented architect, artists, such as Corwin and Waldo Chase and Bellingham's Elizabeth Colburn, whose depictions of the Northwest landscape in woodblock prints were every bit as fine as their more famous contemporaries, such as Francis Gearhart or Bertha Lum. Corwin and Waldo Chase began to work with color block prints in Washington scenery in the early 20s. The Japanese design aesthetic most certainly had an influence on their work. Colburn, who grew up in Bellingham, traveled to New York to study at the Pratt Institute and later the Art Students League. She found work in New York as a delineator and a book illustrator, but she moved back to Bellingham to teach at the Normal School, which is now Western Washington University. 
It was during this time that she began to produce color block prints of regional scenery. Her prints vividly portray the water, mountains, and forests of the northwest corner of Washington. Photography was well established through Oregon and Washington, along with the professional studio photographers and thousands of shutterbugs with their Kodaks. There were a few practitioners <coughs> who viewed photography as a legitimate art form. These art photographers or pictorialists, such as Salem's Helen Gatch and Myra, Myra Wiggins, used whatever means at their disposal to create an image that could evoke an emotional response from the viewer. In Seattle, Imogen Cunningham gained a reputation for both her artistic portraits and landscape photography, not to mention a series of images of her husband, Roy Partridge, posed in the nude on Mount Rainier in 1915. Two years later, she relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area. Seattle photographer Ella McBride became internationally famous for her floral studies. During the 26-27 exhibition season, McBride was one of the most exhibited pictorial photographers in the world, with 71 different photographs exhibited in 21 international salons. And hopefully some of you in Tacoma have been to the Tacoma Art Museum to see the wonderful exhibit of her work a couple of years ago. McBride, along with a group of Japanese American photographers, was instrumental in the creation of the Seattle Camera Club in 1924. Perhaps the best known of that group is Frank Kunishigi, whose 7.15 a.m. on left remains one of the classic Seattle cityscape images of the period. Actually, it looks a lot like Seattle has and Tacoma probably the last couple of days, as does <coughs> the photograph on the right by Wayne Albee, um, working in this vein. Their exhibited photographs position them among the most artistic workers in American pictorialist photography. And any discussion of photography during the period would be incomplete without mentioning Edward Curtis and his monumental work photographing the American Indian. He sought out or created scenes that implied a simpler life in an idealized romantic past, and in doing so, through artistic compositions and technical processes, emotionally pulled the viewer into the finished work. Regional painters recognizing the rich palette of the Northwest landscape worked on plein air, quickly and loosely, capturing on canvas their impressions of scenes around them. Harry Wentz was a supporter of the Arts and Crafts Society of Portland, and by 1910 was deeply involved in art education at the Portland Art Association's Art School. Wentz's sand dune, Niakani, captures the feeling of Oregon's windswept North Coast dunes in color and movement. C.C. McKim is considered Oregon's most consistent representation, representative of regional impressionism. This is Mount Hood from a marsh, a strong example of his work. Washington had several noteworthy artists as well, in Northwest Impressionist style, including Paul Morgan Gustin, who was quoted as saying, I try to paint not only what I actually see with my eyes in a landscape, but what I feel in the landscape, the sense of freedom or of quiet or of freshness. As I hope these images have shown, the arts and crafts movement did flourish in the Pacific Northwest, manifesting itself in many ways, some still very visible. The region played a respectable role in disseminating information on arts and crafts movement, displaying the most important producers of work in America at its fairs and in its art galleries, and advertising and selling these words in its shops and department stores. Furthermore, a vibrant arts community banded together to support one another, to learn the latest methods of working in clay, metal, glass, and wood, and to produce work that was often comparable to the better known, <clears throat> the better known works of East and Midwest and California craftspeople. School children were brought up with a respect for handwork and with skills that would serve them well in building homes, making furniture, and beautiful necessities. My co-author Glenn Mason and I know that there will be those who will look at the, the fine and applied arts created in the Northwest and automatically compare them with the work of the finest artists and craft workers of other regions. If they do, they're missing the point of the arts and crafts movement. 
The fact that so many regional companies sold or manufactured furnishings, or that people build and lived in bungalows, or that school children, hobbyists, laborers, society women, and art workers expressed themselves with objects of beauty and utility would ultimately be more important than the products themselves as people gained respect for handwork and self-taught skills. Ultimately, their view of the world changed as they became more attuned to the value of harmony, balance, color, and proportion in shaping a supportive environment. We were pleased by a review we received in American Bungalow Magazine way back in 2008. Uh, <clears throat> it shows an understanding of our purpose in assembling the work John Luke wrote, most notably, they've restored a particular kind of balance to a story that has elsewhere tended to inflate into a grand narrative of ultimate bungalows and the celebration of $25,000 vases, leaving behind a more modest but vastly more influential tale of changes in the way people lived as an American middle class culture began to form. They framed this tale as a regional one, but it also can be read as simply an American one with more rain and taller trees. Well, I mentioned earlier that um, in 2009, the Museum of History and Industry opened an exhibition that Glenn and I curated. It toured Washington State Museums for two years, including Tacoma, and it gave the public an opportunity to have a hands-on experience with some of the design work we discussed in our book and which I've mentioned in today's lecture. It was a wonderful way to broaden awareness and acceptance of this fascinating period in Puget Sound, Pacific Northwest history. And wherever you go, you can always find a bungalow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. That was a great presentation. You can hear all the uh, virtual applause. I hear it, I hear it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I'm going to read you a question from our Facebook viewers. Um, see here. So he had a few questions. One of them was the Larry House exterior um, look closer to Gothic or Tudor style. That was their comment. And then the other question was, um, there's a strong convergence in the motifs and forms of Northwest Coast Indian art traditions and conventions and arts and crafts design. We've seen passing glimpses of such fusions in, the, in this presentation. I'd be interested in seeing a scholarly exploration of actual expressions of those convergences, if there were a significant number of them. So I don't know if you can um, speak to the influence of um, Native American art in this. Uh, well, I can answer the first question because it was about the Leary House <clears throat> and the Leary House was designed um, with the help of a, a, a Canadian architect who had been, if he'd worked for Samuel McClure, had just finished up or was working on um, um, a marvelous house for the, the uh, Douglas family, which is now the Royal Roads um, University uh, outside of Victoria. And it has that square turreted, castellated look on it. So I think that's probably where his influence came from in the Leary House. It was certainly an impressive house. It was the largest house, residential design in Seattle for many years. In fact, it was built at the end of a cul-de-sac that then later became 10th Avenue East. Uh, but the interiors were, um, the, a lot of the interiors were uh, kind of Jacobean woodwork in the Great Hall and immense lighting fixtures. But it was a mix because the influence of the arts and crafts was very much apparent in um, some of the installations that were done. And it was probably um, the influence of the architects and design professionals who were working with on the house. As far as the Native American influence, um, I'm not prepared to really answer that question. Maybe you can, Steve. Does that ring a bell? the influence of, of Native American design. Uh, the question was about current influences. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it seems sort of uh, yes and no. Uh, a lot of people have, have noticed that, especially with because we've got a convergence of, um, you know, uh, styles uh, coming in from the east, from the east to the west, and then from the far east, uh, Japan, 
Um, and then Native American culture is kind of a um, not, uh, I guess, purest architectural style. Everyone's kind of a uh, buffet style of architecture that includes Native American and uh, art and craft. So, but yeah, I, I haven't heard of any scholarship about that. I, you have a Wayne. Wayne, Wayne has a, a an answer. Uh, so I've been I've been around Larry for forty years now. So I've I've learned a great deal. But if you look at the arts arts and crafts, there is a certain historicity with the arts and crafts. So in Britain, they were looking back to medieval tropes. Uh, and uh, thus you see uh, Burne Jones with her fabulous women looking very medieval in their long dresses. Uh, similarly, here in the Northwest, we looked back to our medieval period, which we would be seeing as the romance of Indian art and the rest. You saw in the pictures where uh, Judge Burke's house was furnished with Indian baskets and other decorations. So there is a melding, and I don't, I also do not know of any um, deep research in that area. Yeah, I don't know of anybody doing it. Um, I do know that, you know, in large, in terms of building, uh, there, there are very few examples of taking Native American longhouse architecture and incorporating it into Seattle buildings. Um, they were much more interested in the Swiss LA. Yeah. Did we introduce Wayne to our audience? <laughs> <coughs> I'm Wayne. <laughs> Somebody should do that research. Yeah, there's a good uh, thesis project. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions at this time? I'm not seeing any more in our Facebook. Page. Um, but if anyone who's on the Zoom has questions, please use the Q&A function. Otherwise, I'll ask um, Steve and Kathleen if you have any, any commentary to add on that with um, things that you see happening in, in Tacoma or anything. Well, this um, in answer to that. Uh, yeah, it just, yeah, two things. Uh, I, I, you shared on the Facebook feed about the uh, Historic Tacoma's uh, kind of a primer guide on uh, Tacoma architecture. Um, uh, the different styles it has um, you know, uh, just walk through and then it gives it examples on the streets. And of course you can go to uh, your site, uh, at the preservation site for a lot of links for walking tours along with uh, downtown on the go. And uh, th those all have those walking tours and stuff. Um, and Larry, I was wondering if uh, UPS had their exhibit that was ended in May over, uh, but probably didn't get much attention because of COVID. Do you know if that has been extended to after this or do they just march on? I really don't know because they haven't been open. So the library hasn't been open either. So we were going to do this talk in May, weren't we? We had it all scheduled for the library at UPS. At UPS. Yeah. Maybe talk, it's still there. Talk about the exhibit itself. Well, I can check in and find out. Yeah, it was an exhibit of, uh, was it Arts and Crafts, um, uh, ephemera and uh, greeting cards and Yoshiko Yamamoto's work, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Wonderful yeah. artist. Um, but the Tacoma Art Museum, you know, for me, I remember when the Tacoma Art Museum was downtown on, in their old bank building and they, uh, with the director who was there at the time, who then moved on to the Building Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, had a marvelous arts and crafts exhibit. And that was, you know, one of the few opportunities in the Northwest to see a lot of wonderful materials that had been gathered. Um, yeah, I think that was cool that uh, I didn't get a chance to see it at UPS, but uh, one of the things I liked about it is that it brought the, the modern arts and crafts movement, like with uh, Ch uh, Chandler O'Leary and uh, Taylor Cox and local folks um, kind of forwarding the movement in 2020. Well, I will say that there are an, a huge number of, not a huge number, but a large number of, of, of uh, craft, cottage craft people who are out there still doing reproduction furniture, textiles, hand-on textiles, and uh, um, metalwork, um, and doing beautiful jobs with it. And, um, you know, it's, it's not something that we teach in the schools anymore, which is why 
the, the early part of the 20th century was such a progressive era in terms of looking at learning and how people learn and that people have different learning styles and, and skill sets and to offer those people who could work with their hands as much as you know the math and science side. Uh, we don't do that quite so much anymore. Looks like Kathleen had a response also. Kathleen? You know, I was thinking <clears throat> about the uh, first question related to Native American influence in the bungalow style. And I was thinking about the Southwest and the Fred Harvey houses and Mary Coulter's designs, which were uh, from the late teens and into the early 20s that did uh, incorporate Native American motifs uh, combined with uh, Hispanic influence. And when you think about the influence of the railroad, each of these um, Harvey House stops along the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe featured a snapshot of the Southwest, the crafts, the arts of the Native American Pueblo people. And I think that was very influential and sort of a cross fertilization with the bungalow movement. Yeah, I'd agree with that, definitely. We just all need to take a train trip again. That's about all I have. Um, yeah, I see our, our Facebook uh, viewers said thank you for answering the questions and um, he's awaiting some more rigorous exploration on this topic from further researchers. <laughs> so if anyone was looking for a research topic, there you go. Um, I see no other questions coming in, so I will wrap it up unless anybody's got any final words, any pitches for Historic Tacoma or, or um, Tacoma Historical Society. The next lecture will be by Amber Hayward from the Puyallup Language School, and she will be talking about the restoration and preservation of the Puyallup language, <laughs> excuse me, um, and, and what they're doing in the community to keep their culture alive. So that's what I have for you. Well, thank you for inviting me, Lauren and, and Kathleen and Steve, and good night to you. Really, really wonderful uh, lecture in it. And I think it, it came across beautifully, visually. And thank you so much, Larry. And the book is out of print, um, but it can be purchased by going to Amazon. There are still a number of used books floating around there in space, and they're quite reasonably priced. So. And it, and it is a beautiful book and the illustrations are very high quality. So I recommend it. A lot Thank more there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Steve.